But, Captain, we both know that I am not human. Spock, you want to know something? Everybody's human. I find that remark insulting. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we are returning to the world of Star Trek to conclude our exploration of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in California, as well as a voiceover artist, massive Star Trek fan, and excited to be going back into the undiscovered country with these two gentlemen. And speaking of the other gentlemen, of course, we couldn't explore Star Trek without my partner in all things Trek, Scott Mance. Welcome back to the Cinephiles. It's so great to be back here in the Cinephiles with you fine gentlemen, talking movies, talking Star Trek. There's no place I'd rather be because every time I'm on the Cinephiles talking about movies, it is always the best conversation I've ever had talking about movies. Aww. I know I say that to you. Every time we talk together, every time we talk individually, but it is absolutely true. I mean it 100% from the bottom of my heart. The Cinephiles is the best movie show out there, anywhere, hands down. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much. And very kind. Speaking, speaking of shows, I know we've already announced it, and you've probably been hearing a lot about it, but Scott and I have started a Star Trek podcast called Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. We are going in production order through the original series, which now has its 55th anniversary as we mm -hmm. speak. But we are not here to talk about the original series. We're here to talk about the original characters. And what just happened is McCoy and Captain Kirk have just been arrested for the murder of Chancellor Gorkin. And we return to the Enterprise as they react to this arrest. They've been arrested. I assume command of the ship as of 0230 hours. And of course, the first thing is, well, we can't let them be taken to Kronos. And Spock goes, What do you suggest, Lieutenant? Opening fire will not retrieve them. And an armed conflict is precisely what the captain wished to avoid. And then he says this interesting thing. He says, we will be able to follow his movements. And that yeah. is because of the Velcro patch that he subtly puts on Kirk's, uh, uh, I guess, is uh, the upper left-hand side of his back. And if you're watching, if you're watching Star Trek VI closely, when Spock offers to go with Kirk to Kronos to figure out what the hell happened, Kirk says, "I'm going to need you to stay here to get me out of whatever whatever I'm going to get into." And Spock says, perhaps you're right. And he puts he puts his hand over Kirk's shoulder as if to sort of, sort of like pat him on the back kind of thing. You know, uh, uh, it, is a, it is a moment of, of comfort between two friends, but really what he's doing, he's putting a traceable patch on his back so he can follow him wherever Kirk winds up going. And if you watch, when you watch Star Trek VI again, watch it, you will see a black, velcro patch mm -hmm. on kirk's uniform on his back yep um and of course the other thing we discuss is that that they say well we didn't fire the torpedoes and then the question is how are we going to prove it and this sort of starts the mystery element of star mm -hmm. trek six then we're going to cut all around the galaxy for the reactions and politics of this arrest and first we go to uh, the head of the Federation, uh, the president of the Federation, who's played by an interesting actor. Kurtwood Smith, one of the greatest sideburns and massive hair you're ever going to see, my man. Yeah, and he's got the glasses and he's looking very, <laughs> very, very, very groovy. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the big question is, should Kirk and McCoy stand trial? And of course, the Federation doesn't want him to, but we've got all these treaties. We expect the Federation to abide by the articles of interstellar law, which you claim to cherish. And one of the people that we ask about what has to happen is Ambassador Sarek. Mark Leonard is in the room. Mr. President, I share a measure of personal responsibility in this matter, but I am obliged to confirm my esteemed colleague's legal interpretation. Spock's father has, has made his mark in Star Trek III, Star Trek IV, and now in Star Trek VI, 
he had the wisdom to <laughs> to skip out of Star Trek V. <laughs> I wish I could say I I I wish he would have like spoken to us first and said, guys, you could sit this one out. But you know, we are loyal fans of that crew and we watched it, yeah. flaws and all anyway. Right. But right now we're getting ready for the trial because the agreement basically is yes, Kirk and McCoy will be tried by the Klingons. The Federation will not interfere but we will also go forward with this peace treaty. So both things are happening and one is dependent upon the other. And we hear cheering of the name Kirk and we are with Kirk and McCoy as they rise up in this elevator into the Klingon courtroom. And it's just an amazing Star Trek moment, I think. It, it is a great Star Trek moment. I mean, you hear the the Klingons chanting Kirk, 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 <laughs> because you know what? They they hate him as much as he hates them. Yeah. And uh, and this, you know, one thing that we haven't really mentioned uh, up to this point, and it has to be mentioned now, especially because of an actor that we are going to see in the scene, is that this movie in particular was seen as as definitely a passing of the torch from the original crew to the next generation. Now I know mm -hmm. I know that that the, the the film that came after this Star Trek Generations was was even more of a passing of the torch, uh literal and figurative, but but uh there 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 is you can feel the passing of the guard with Star Trek 6 to to the next generation crew and at that time in 1991 uh next gen and Star Trek in particular was at its it was at its most popular peak with the 25th anniversary of Star Trek and there were fans there were new fans younger fans who loved next generation more than they loved the original series at that point mm -hmm. by the by the time they were filming Star Trek 6 they had already filmed the first four seasons of next generation and to Star Trek as a whole was never more popular than it was during its 25th anniversary. And the popularity of Next Generation eclipsing that of the original crew, which as a fan of the original series, I don't know, I felt a little like I was being left behind in some way because mm. I liked Next Generation very, very much, but I didn't like seeing this new crew on this new show sort of become more popular than the original series. How do you how do you get better than Kirk, Spock, and McCoy? But that is what Next Generation was doing. And by this point, with the third and fourth season of Next Generation being as great as they were, and definitely sort of wiped away the uh, the the badness of the first two seasons, I was definitely very, very much into Next Generation, but not as a replacement for the original series. And it was upsetting that this point that 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 was happening, but watching this film and especially this scene, there's a character that we're going to see that uh, is definitely a tip of the hat to the next generation and one character in particular. Um, a couple things about this set, which I think is funny. This is the redressed set from the Next Generation pilot encounter at Farpoint oh, wow. with the trial with Q. This is the <laughs> same set. Uh, there's a lot of force perspective, which makes it look much, much better, bigger than it is. And force perspective means things start big, but then they design it smaller and smaller as it goes far away. So it looks much further. And in fact, it's so much force perspective that the top row of Klingon audience, the 200 Klingons looking down from the top at Kirk are 200 Worf action figures. What? Wow. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. All right. That's extremely cool. You know what else is funny? They used the same figures to be uh, there in The Rise of Skywalker to be in the stands <laughs> for the Emperor as well. For the Emperor as well. <laughs> little known fact. Um, and we go into the trial. I love the little details like the sparking round gavel that the judge mm. has. And we do a thing that we have seen a few times on the cinephiles, which is this 
trial, uh, Christopher Plummer's speech is being translated and subtitled. So we are he hearing the Klingon. Wow, da, ba, ba. And the camera zooms in and we hear the people in different parts of the galaxy because they're all um, watching this trial, getting the translation. The Enterprise fired on Kronos 1. And then suddenly, Christopher Plummer is speaking English on the line. Having been lulled into a false sense of security. John, do you remember the two places we have seen a technique like this? I do not, please clarify. The one that I knew first is Hunt for Red October and the word oh, Armageddon. When switched, right, when they switched oh, that's over. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're John talking in Russian and then before then they're 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 just zoom in on the mouth. Right. So that they could, you know, just dispense with the subtitles exactly. and just speak in English for the for the uh, ease of the people watching the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and John McTiernan was inspired to do this from a movie I had never seen until we did it on the Cinephiles that strangely enough has William Shatner in it, and that is oh, Judgment, Judgment at Nuremberg. Nuremberg. And Nicholas Meyer is totally referencing Judgment at Nuremberg. Ha, He's 100% right. conscious. With Maximilian Schell, yep. And then we get a few uh, witnesses basically explaining what we already knew. We see the guy who's you know got no arm. He talks about the crewman. And then we have this moment where um, the defense attorney, Colonel Worf, played by Michael Dorn, our Lieutenant Commander or Lieutenant Worf's grandfather, I think, mm -hmm. asks a really stupid question. He's really not a good attorney. No, he's not. Like, I, I mean, I thought like, like when I knew that that Michael Dorn was going to play Worf's grandfather and he was going to be sort of the defense attorney for for Kirk and McCoy, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be great. He's going to be a great character, but he's actually a bad lawyer. <laughs> he's terrible. <laughs> if the gravitational unit was not functioning, how could these men be walking? And it's like, well, they had magnetic boots. It's like, you never ask a question that you that you don't want to hear the answer to. That's a right. terrible lawyer. <laughs> and then General Chang asks Dr. McCoy about his current medical status. Hmm. And McCoy oh. makes a joke. Aside from a touch of arthritis, I'd say pretty good. <laughs> and, and I like how like you hear one person in the background laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and McCoy's kind of happy. He's a little pleased with himself making a joke. This was not the right place to make a joke. No. And and frankly, I I not only did the Klingons think it wasn't, and Chang doesn't think it was a good joke, but I think, look, you're being tried for the assassination of their leader. Mm -hmm. It's not a time to make a joke, Bones. This is read the room, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely and, read the room. But but the, the fact is, I mean, uh, as General Chang, Christopher Plummer in this scene is is absolutely fantastic. He is the most committed actor in this scene. He's just so great. His performance is so great. I mean, you get an actor like that in a in a Star Trek film. Come on, you're gonna you're gonna take it to a, a level that Star Trek films. Even the best of them just don't get to. Mm -hmm. I would say that Christopher Plummer is the greatest lawyer, trial lawyer on Star Trek since Samuel T. Cogley in the episode Court Martial. That's yes. what I'll say. <laughs> um, and he ta he takes McCoy apart. And, and I love it, too, because it's all absolutely true. Weren't you drinking? Yeah, we were all drinking. Well, was he alive when you got there? Yeah, was barely alive. Have you saved people that were barely alive? Yes. Why didn't you save him? Well, I wasn't familiar with the anatomy. Do your handshake. McCoy is getting flustered. Yeah. He's yeah. getting flustered. But he says, he looks at Chang and he says, he says, you were there. And when McCoy looks at Chang in his eye, not his eyes, because one of them has a big patch nailed into his skull. Chang looks down and mm. away from McCoy mm -hmm. because he knows that McCoy is right. He was right. there. He witnessed what happened. And because he was actually there, he has insight to actually be like, you know, maybe they didn't have anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. But that's not that's not what's going on here because Chang is out to get Kirk. Uh, because of where they're at with the whole sort of fall of the wall, so yeah. to speak. Yep. Well, and I think, so of course we know Chang is the bad guy. We know that Chang no knows that McCoy and Kirk didn't kill the chancellor, that in fact he was part of the conspiracy to kill the chancellor. But I think this whole sequence is totally motivatable on his part because the fact is everything he says about McCoy is true. 
He had mm-hmm. been drinking. He didn't know Klingon anatomy. He didn't save this guy. His hands were shaking. Now we know, and I love this moment, and I think DeForest Kelly is great when he says, oh my God, man, I tried to save him. I was desperate to save him. He was the last best hope in the universe for peace. His voice is breaking yeah. when yeah. he's saying this. I mean, DeForest Kelly, yeah, this is this is his last appearance as McCoy in Star Trek. Oh yeah. Uh, right. Because he had already filmed his uh, cameo and encounter at Farpoint right. in 1987. Mm. So, so this movie is the last time that the Forrest Kelly is playing McCoy and he passed away in, uh, I think it was 98. Wow. And he, he, he's terrific in the film, but you could tell that he's, he's definitely up there. Yeah. In as much as Plummer's performance in his interrogation of McCoy is great. His performance when he turns on James Kirk is even better. And now we come to the architect of this tragic affair. James Tiberius Kirk. <laughs> One thing about the name, he says, James Tiberius Kirk. It, it, it was established that the T in James T. Kirk was Tiberius. Mm-hmm. In not an episode of the original series, but an episode of the animated series. Mm. But the animated series was was considered canon. I hate that word canon, but that's the word that people use is canon. Yeah. Yeah. I hear canon all the time with Star Wars, and it oh, just yeah. it irritates me to no end. <laughs> but for, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, canon does fit. And but this was the only other time outside of the animated series. This was the only live action mention of Tiberius that we ever heard in the Star Trek series or the Star Trek movies. Until we get to 2009, because the kid says it. Right. uh, At the beginning of 2009. That's a great point. I hadn't thought about the fact of how, it's so funny how we know stuff so clearly that was mentioned so little, you know? What would your favorite author say, Captain? Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. Tell us your sad story, Kirk. Tell us that you plan to take revenge for the death of your son. And then we hear his captain's log. I've never trusted Klingons. And I never will. I've never been able to forgive them for the death of my boy. And they play it twice. And, and, and you could see just the horror on Shatner's face. Yeah. You know, he plays it so well. Like, But this is also when Kirk... Because he's got that mind, starts to put the pieces together. This is, I think, once he once he gets over the initial shock of how they got access to this uh, voiceover recording of his thoughts, uh, his log, in essence. Um, then he's like, okay, who was around? Who was there? Who was the, like? I think he's slowly starting to put together wh- how this all happened. Uh, and there's almost a calm that comes over him uh, the rest of the time where they're in prison and all this whole thing. He's just very much understanding what needs to happen here. And he now that he has a direction to go, he can start to figure it out, you know? Yeah, he's done. I, I agree. You know, you can see that he's he's he starts piecing it together, John, because how the hell did they get a hold yes. of Kirk's personal log? Right. And he's starting to think that there's that he's starting to think the game's afoot. Okay, yes, he's starting yes. to think that there is there is a uh, there's something definitely wrong with the situation. I was recording a personal log that was for my for my eyes and ears only, right. and it landed in the hands of the friggin' Klingons. And he's he's absolutely agree. He's aware that. That something is definitely wrong here. Yeah, definitely. And I love, I mean, again, I think Chang's prosecuting attorney, his argument, Mm. if I were the jury and I only knew what was presented in this trial, I probably would find Kirk guilty too. Like, because the next thing he comes at him with is... This officer's record shows him to be an insubordinate, unprincipled, career-minded opportunist with a history of violating the chain of command whenever it suited him and that he was demoted from being an admiral for taking matters into his own hands. And 
And I love this moment. This moment was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Do you deny being demoted for these charges? Don't wait for the translation. Answer me now. Oh, he he's so great. He's so great. When he when he says it, he's riled up, the, the adrenaline is going, he goes, don't wait for the translation. Answer me now. Oh my God. It's such a great scene. <laughs> it is. And made even better by Kirk's half pause and smirk at Chang because Chang has broken. Chang has shown the first um, how can I say this? The first opening in his defense that he has shown since him and Kirk have come together. So when he says, Andrew, no! Kirk goes and hesitates and there's this little smile. I violated Bull's laws from time to time. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's, the, there's a confidence <laughs> that, as I said, there's a confidence coming over Kirk now. He's putting the pieces together. Can he carry out his plan to overturn this? Who knows? But he's putting the pieces together. And Chang, letting his emotions get the best of him, warrior to warrior, fighter to fighter, you know it's the one who gets the most emotional that you can be beaten. And right, so right. in that moment, Kirk understands... He's part of this, I think, subtly. And yeah. that's why he delivers the smirk. And that's why he has the confidence going forward that he can figure this thing out. And you're right. There's this pause. And, and, and you know, that that Shatnerian pause. He goes, yeah. he, right? He goes, on occasion, I have disregarded orders. Yes. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. It's great. <laughs> well, one more thing about this moment, because this is a Cold War movie. Well, this line, don't wait for the translation, is a Cold War reference because this is what Adlai Stevenson said to the Russian ambassador at the UN during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no. This is a one of the most important moments in the Cold War of all time. Wow. Wow. See, I mean, listen, Nicholas Meyer, who who wrote the screenplay for the film for, for Star Trek Six with Denny Martin Flynn, you know, he is a really, really smart guy. Yeah. He is so, so smart. And and again, you know, this movie just feels so tonally different from Star Trek Two. It's you know, Star Trek Two has there has a confidence about it. And, and even though it feels like military, more military than we'd ever seen Starfleet, which was something that Roddenberry didn't like. But back to Star Trek II, there was a confidence to it. Like, like Kirk had his swagger, okay? Yeah. He was, was happy to be back on the Enterprise, even if it's just to oversee the training crew. But he was in a really good mood. The Kirk that we see in Star Trek VI is bitter. You can see that he's... Like, I mean, not just visually because he has gray in his hair, but the spark isn't there for Kirk in this movie. I think that Shatner's performance in Star Trek II, and I'm comparing apples to apples because they were both directed by Nicholas Meyer. I think Shatner's performance in Star Trek II was his best performance in a Star Trek movie. And uh, also one of his best performances as James T. Kirk across the entire Star Trek series. But for much of Star Trek VI, you know, part of the reason why I didn't quite love it was because I didn't like the way Kirk looked in this movie. I didn't like the fact that he was so bitter. I didn't like that that there was a, a fire that was missing from Shatner's performance. I didn't like seeing so much bigotry and hatred within the Federation. Um, it was, I mean, by the standards of today with Star Trek, especially after Star Trek Discovery and Picard, which were very dark and very violent, yeah. uh, Star Trek Six is actually more like the original series, but at the time, it was the darkest Trek we had seen, and it was, it. I mean, it makes for a very good movie, but it was it was disconcerting for me as a lifelong Star Trek fan to see Kirk and the Federation depicted in this way. Well, I think the difference. I think you bring up a really good point, and I think the difference between. Kirk in Star Trek II and Kirk in Star Trek VI is the story, the character arc in Star Trek II is I feel old. I feel like I've lost my purpose. I don't know what I should be doing now. And then by the end, I feel young and I found my purpose. He finds, that is a movie about him finding his spark again. This is a movie about, you know what? It's actually over. 
you right. know, like yeah. this is a movie about the end. And so while he, it's like, it's like, and he does find one last gasp of his spark to get to the end of this film, but it isn't, you know, we're back. That's right. not what this is at That's all. That's not what this is. And, and it, it is a, uh, it is a movie about endings. I mean, the undiscovered country may mean the future, but it, it also means, it also means death. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the, the fact that, you know, later on, later on in the, in the film, you know, there's a scene between Kirk and Spock where they're talking about how they are, are we so old that we have outlived our usefulness? You're right. It's different from the I feel old of Star Trek II because he feels old because he took a desk job and he yeah. wasn't on, sitting on the center seat of a starship, which is where he belonged. But by this point, I mean, Star Trek VI is supposed to take place many, many years later, not just nine years between 1982's Wrath of Khan and 1991's Undiscovered Country, but many years later where, yeah, they are older and they are so old that maybe they have outlived their usefulness and they have one last shot of redemption, which we see, which we do see, actually. Yeah. And the final moment of the trial is not so much, did you assassinate Gorkin? It's, are you responsible for your crew? And after a bit of resistance, Kirk says, as captain, I am responsible for the conduct of the crew under my command. And the cut that's so important after this moment is we cut to Spock. Because what is Spock feeling at this moment? He got Kirk into this. Th this is his fault. And yet in trial for his life, Kirk takes responsibility because he's the captain. And by the way, this moment is actually referenced in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Unification Part 2, mm. which aired in the fall of 1991, just a few weeks before Star Trek VI opened in theaters. Oh, wow. So Unification's part one and two uh, from the fourth season. Part one, we don't see Spock until the very, very, well, we see a, um, uh, uh, we see, sort of see a screen grab of him in the opening credits. And then we don't see him in person, so to speak, until the very end mm. during the cliffhanger of part one. But then Unification part two is all about Spock. And he makes a comment like, I cannot betray you and put you in a situation like I did with the, Captain Kirk, and he's referencing this moment that you just did in the undiscovered country. It was a way to bridge, at the same time that Star Trek VI was serving as a bridge to the next generation, right. next generation also did its bit to bridge to the new Star Trek film that was coming out. It's a great example of doing a completely mercenary marketing thing by linking these two things yeah. that totally made me happy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, because totally. I love seeing Spock show up in Next Generation. And we go to the Excelsior where Sulu sends a message to the Enterprise. We see Rand is crying. We see a close up of Sarek. We, he's been pronounced guilty. And then the question is the sentence. And the sentence of death is commuted. You'll be taken from this place to the dilithium mines on the penal asteroid of Rurapente. There to spend the rest of your natural lives. And I love the cuts here. It cuts in very aggressively to Kirk and McCoy in a very jarring sort of way. And you know, one, one thing about the finishing of the trial that I think is great is once again, uh, Chang doesn't get what he wanted, right? Because they don't get uh, convicted uh, to be killed. They don't get the execution conviction. They do get repent, and you see Chang's reaction when the judge doesn't give them the death penalty and offers just a little bit of daylight to both McCoy and Kirk to stay alive in Ruripente. And, Kirk, and Chang knows Kirk staying alive means anything can happen. And so his face, uh, you can see it in his face, and he can't challenge the judge because he's on Klingon, and it's a Klingon judge. But he has to live with it, and the fact that he has to live with it, I think, scares Chang deep inside. And I love that uh, uh, decision by the screenwriters to go this route, uh, because it allows for so much more drama going forward. And then we return to the bridge of the Enterprise for their reactions to this. And they're speechless. Everyone's kind of looking around at each other. 
Better to kill him now and get it over with. Scotty's really got a dark side in this, uh, in does. this movie, doesn't he? <laughs> he really does. Then we're back to Spock is right back on the mystery. The, the mystery element that you're talking about, Steve, is sort of what turns Star Trek VI and Spock in particular into a Sherlock Holmes mo- movie because like they have to figure out, well, something fired on the Klingon warship, something fired on Kronos One. And if the Enterprise, if their photon torpedoes are fully loaded, but the 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 computer is showing that they fired two torpedoes, then something something is rotten in Denmark, so to speak. And they have to use deductive reasoning to figure out what exactly happened. And Spock has a great line. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. That is very, very much a Sherlock Holmes moment. And yeah. it's fitting because the director of Star Trek VI is Nicholas Meyer, and he is a big, a very big fan of Sherlock Holmes. And he actually wrote a Sherlock Holmes book called oh. The 7% Solution. Oh, that's so him? That's him. Yep. I didn't know that was him. Wow. Yes, okay. He wrote that book. So he is very much inspired, a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. And this is where Star Trek VI feels very different from Star Trek II because of the, of the smarts that they use, uh, not just Spock, but also Uhura and Scotty and right. Chekhov to an extent. So that's and I and I love this part of the film because of that. Say, it's fascinating because you've you've got this whole um, mystery element to this that I rarely see in Star Trek. Like, yes, you do see them trying to figure out things and, and trying to negotiate some peace and, and f- you know, why am I getting, why am I dressed up as a Greek thing or whatever? Or why is Lincoln here? Or why is, why are we at the OK Corral? These are all things, but like, this is a genuine mystery. And you could also argue that this may be the most European feeling of all the six hmm. uh, movies because of the, as you said, the Sherlock Holmes bent, but also the Shakespeare bent to this as well. So at least British feeling, if not overall European feeling, approach to this. And you could argue that Chang is Kirk's Moriarty. If there's anyone that can match him back and forth, it could be Chang. As that's a, that's a great point. That's a really great point. And, you know, with regards to the Shakespeare element, Shakespeare has always played a very big part in Star Trek over True. the three True. years, especially with the original series, mm-hmm. uh, especially because some of the some of the episode titles are quotes of Shakespeare. But yeah, good point. Yeah. the it's not just that Shakespeare is quoted frequently in Star Trek six is that the actor who is quoting him is just raised not just star trek <laughs> yeah. six but right. the but playing a klingon to a whole another level and of course that's uh, the late great christopher Plummer. yes and uh he certainly uh dove into his shakespeare appreciation during the dinner scene uh right before the you know the you know what hit the fan <laughs> but uh just wait until the finale of this movie uh, very, very Shakespearean, and I, I agree, Johnny, 100%, that between Shakespeare and Sherlock Holmes, this movie feels very, very different and unique from from every st- other Star Trek film, not just the ones featuring the original cast. Mm. So I, I think that's a great point both of you are making, and what, what just occurred to me, and I I'm, finally get to put it, can put it into words because of what you both just said, is that there are really three stylistic stylistically different stories being told in this there is the cold war story and the story of kirk's hatred of the of the klingons and racism that is very very heavy there's this mystery story that has a completely different tone which is spock leading the mystery to find out who what how these torpedoes got fired and who killed gorkon and then the third one is we're going to get into classic star trek adventure mm-hmm. once we get to repente what exactly does that mean it means that if we cannot have fired those torpedoes, someone else did. And they return back to the neutron surge and suddenly go, there must have been another ship. Valera says, a Klingon bird of prey. And they go, cloaked? I mean, they can't fire when they're cloaked. And Spock goes, well, all things being equal, this one can. According to our data banks, this ship fired those torpedoes. If we did, the killers are here. If we did not, 
whoever altered the databanks is here. In either case, what we are looking for is here. It's deductive reasoning. You know, he's, he's eliminating all these yeah. other things. And that's where his quote, the eliminate the impossible, whatever happened, uh, however probable, must be true, you know. And that is what Spock is doing. He's being Sherlock Holmes at this moment. Mm -hmm. And the big question is, so what are we looking for? And the answer, two pairs of gravity boots. And so this is now we're fully on the mystery part of the show. And now we're going to go kind of to the adventure part of the show because we head off to Rura Pente. Uh, by the way, the snow is made out of styrofoam and potato flakes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> which is really loud and crunchy. So all the, the sound is dubbed in. And this looks, you know, McCoy and Kirk are in these, you know, animal furs. And they all look really dirty. It looks really brutal. There is no stockade. No guard tower. Punishment means exile from prison to the surface. On the surface, nothing can survive. And they throw a half-naked guy out into the snow to die. And Kirk and McCoy, they just walk by. Mm -hmm. McCoy does not act on his Hippocratic Oath, which still exists in that century, and does not try to save this man. And I found that to be one of the most interesting things on this rewatch this time around. I always just kind of breezed past it when I've watched it in the past, but this time around, it kind of struck me. I, is McCoy rattled by what, as you pointed out earlier, Scott, as uh, by rattled by what Chang said to him, by the grilling Chang gave him, saying, your hands were shaking, you were drinking, you didn't understand how to work on this body, you, you didn't know this, this uh, the physiology of a Klingon, but yet you decided to put yourself in this situation. So maybe he sees someone else fall out of there possibly die and he doesn't trust himself enough to save this man or doesn't trust himself enough to to help this person and also at the base level doesn't want to die so i mean yeah. there's just that moment but i wonder if maybe a piece of because he doesn't even make an effort to move towards it if he'd made an effort and stopped then maybe you could forgive him a little bit but the fact that he doesn't even make an effort shows me that this is a this is kind of a broken man at this point going into repente i think that's a great great point work well and you will be treated well. Work badly, and you will die. And these lines, work well and you will be treated well, and the no stockade, that's all references to Bridge on the River Kwai. That is very much what Sesu Hayakawa, is that his name? Uh, says to, uh, to Alec Guinness when they come in to work on the prison camp on Bridge on the River Kwai. Verpente is also the uh, penal column that we saw in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Oh, really? Yes. So, I did not know yeah, that. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea uh, with James Mason as, oh. uh, uh, yeah, as uh, Captain Nemo. I had um, no idea. Yeah, Verpente from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So, this was inspired by that. We go into these caves. This was shot at Bronson Canyon, which there are these caves that are just a couple miles from my house in Griffith Park. So Kirk and McCoy are, I mean, they're still wearing their uniforms, but they're filthy. They haven't shaved in days and they're wearing whatever animal furs they can wear to, to stay warm. But they, they still have sort of a sense of humor and, and some levity to themselves when they're trying to just stay alive against the other prisoners who are looking at them like fresh meat. And one of them is even picking on, on Kirk. Huge guy who grabs Kirk, can't talk to him, no universal translator. And it's going to be a big fight. He picks up Jim Kirk and then we hear a voice. And this is Marta Iman. And she says something to this guy and he puts Kirk down. So we have now gotten one of the big guest stars in this movie, and that is Iman. What do you think about her in this film? I like her in the film. I, I'm not always the biggest uh, um, Iman fan in terms of her acting. Certainly she's an incredible brand, very smart businesswoman in terms of her acting, but she blends seamlessly 
into this Star Trek, but she's always had an exotic look. So to make her another species is not like Tilda Swinton. You just, it's not a, 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 a jump in logic or a leap in logic. It's very believable. And she plays it so well, so confidently. Uh, and even when she's voicing over the other people that are in those costumes as taller aliens or whatever, it all works so well and seamlessly. And she's yeah. great because she's beautiful as well. I, I agree. I thought that she fit in really great. I thought she really held her own uh, in, in the scope of a movie like this, science fiction, uh, the the sets, the makeup, uh, certainly going head to head, literally, mm -hmm. literally with Shatner. Uh, I thought that she was a great addition. Uh, she didn't sort of stick out in, in a in a in a bad way. She yeah. stuck out in a good way, and I agree with John. She has a she has a very exotic look. Where, you know, making her an alien, she fit in great. Mm -hmm. And I love the Tilda Swinton reference. Uh, you know, she was uh, awesome in Snowpiercer. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm with Johnny on this. Also, Two. Kirk always seems to attract the hottest alien. So just, yeah, it's just, sure. it's just standard well, Kirk practice. Yeah. Yeah. That is what, that is what I don't like about it. That, that oh, really? where it goes in that direction. I'm not happy with it, but I totally agree. I think, you know, when I hear about, oh, they're going to cast a non-actor in the role, I'm always worried. And mm. I think she's great. I think yeah. she's used perfectly. I think she does a great job. Question for you. Yes. Is the big guy that picks up Kirk part of the plan to hook Marta up with Kirk and McCoy. Uh, I didn't see it that way, but th did you? <laughs> Not until this last time. I'd never seen it that way before. But then I went, well, she fought, you know, because th the, the spoiler alert is she is A, going to help them escape, and B, she's it's a setup for them to get killed. And this is this way, her stopping this fight is an instant way to connect them the moment they walk into Ruripente. So this last time watching, I went, oh, and she stops the fight really easily. So I went, oh, maybe this is all a setup. Like maybe even this this uh, uh, alien picking up Kirk and yes. sort of messing around with him was part was part of of her setup. Yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm possibly. That's a that's a really, really good point. We're back on the Enterprise in the middle of our search. We're in the galley, and again, we have all these sets doubled from Next Generation. I can't believe what this set is. This is Deanna Troy's quarters. Wow, interesting. It's the galley. And we see actual, real food being cooked on Star Trek, which I don't think we've ever seen. Maybe you would know better than me. No, we did not. <laughs> and, and what's funny is it's real food. It's not like replicated food. And this is what Nicholas Meyer's explanation was. He said... In order to have 20 chickens, you have to start with one real chicken and then duplicate it 19 times in order to have the chickens on the Enterprise. That's not how I figured the replicators worked on the Enterprise in my way of thinking, but that's what he decided. But that, uh, what, I, what I didn't realize is that even in the galley, there is a, uh, a compartment full of phasers. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, and it's funny. <laughs> there are certain moments in movies where I go, that is a great moment. That makes no sense at all. Yeah, and the that moment makes is no we're, sense. <laughs> we're talking about um, why didn't they just uh, phaser disintegrate the gravity boots with the phaser? And <laughs> Valeris opens up that cabinet, pulls out a phaser, shoots a pot, <laughs> setting off this big alarm. And that's to show that you can't fire a phaser in the Enterprise without an alarm. That is a crazy thing that she does in that moment. It is totally unbelievable, but kind of cool. It is kind of cool, yes. I like Valeris. I, I thought that Kim Cattrall was, was terrific in the role. <laughs> and then, of course, there are people, Hora and later Scotty, come in like, did someone fire a phaser? Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm wondering. John, what do you what do you think? Because Valeris, we later find out, is part of this conspiracy. And yeah. yet she really seems to be a great investigator mm -hmm. in this moment. Why is she investigating so well, I guess is my question. Have you ever seen The Verdict? She is Charlotte oh. Rampling in The Verdict. She is oh. Charlotte Rampling and giving you, so she's ingratiating herself with Spock even more. She knows Spock's going to be more forgiving of her. So she has to show that she's totally on his side and she does it in certain ways that don't necessarily lead to them advancing the investigation to find the people involved. And when they do get close, those two people end up dead. So she is just kind of monitoring it, kind of deciding where the navigate where the investigation is going. Uh, so in that way, she's kind of in control of the situation and can dole out the information as she sees fit. 
If I know the captain, by this time, he is deep into planning his escape. Again, we started when Kirk got to Ropente with him fighting a giant alien, and we cut back to him fighting a new giant alien. This one blue. Everyone watching and laughing. <laughs> McCoy says, you got him right where you want him, which he doesn't. <laughs> apparently, at one point, Kirk gets kind of rolls over a fire, and apparently, they say that's really Shatner doing that. That surprised me. Oh wow, I didn't even know that. But uh, yeah, cool. That's you know, Shatner yeah. did his own stunts uh, yeah. sometimes, especially in the movies. Uh, T.J. T- Hooker, he definitely did his own stunts. He was hanging on to the hood of that police car. Sure. Yeah, totally, he was. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, and we do a double kick to this guy's, you know, knees, and he goes down with a groan. I was lucky that thing had knees. That was not his knee. Yeah, not 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 everyone keeps their genitals in the same place, Captain. <laughs> so Nick Myers didn't want the second line. He just wanted that was not his knees. And the studio said they're not going to get the joke. You have to tell them what the joke is. Oh, and I totally agree with Nick Myers. I think it's funnier. If you had done that was not his knees and then cut to a reaction shot of Kirk understanding what that meant. Right, I think yeah, that yeah. would have been funny. You would have gotten it. You know, you would have totally. gotten it. She go, oh, that was not his knees. And then a reaction of Kirk yeah. going, oh, you know, something like that. Like, well, And then cut back to the guy on the ground groaning and everyone would like, you know, tell it with, you know, this is goes into show, don't tell and visual storytelling. <laughs> Explaining the joke does not make the joke funnier. It's nighttime. This is an interesting scene with Kirk and McCoy. Bones, are you afraid of the future? I don't mean this future. What is this? Multiple choice? Some people are afraid of what might happen. I was terrified. When have you ever heard Kirk say something like, I was terrified? You know, we don't see a lot of vulnerability I mean, we did periodically in the original series where, let's say, in the naked time when he gets uh, when he gets the disease and he's yeah talking, you know, about losing the Enterprise. You know, there's the scene in Balance of Terror where he's in his quarters with McCoy and he right. and he's talking about, you know, I I everyone everyone on the bridge is looking around me. Uh, what if I'm wrong? You know, we we do see moments of vulnerability with Kirk in the original series. Not a lot uh, because, you know, he's always projected to be the cool, calm, collected captain. And there's that great scene in The Wrath of Khan when they're on the Genesis, when they're in the Genesis cave where uh, Kirk is going, I feel old and worn out. But in terms of being afraid like that, no, you're right. We've never seen that. And I love McCoy's response because it is so much what we saw in the relationship with McCoy and Kirk throughout the series. What terrified you specifically? Kirk says in a really vulnerable way. I was used to hating Klingons. It never even occurred to me to take Gorkin at his word. A moment like this where Kirk realizes he is wrong. These are moments that made the character of James T. Kirk so appealing. I mean, sure, he was the captain and he was in charge and he was cool, and calm and collected and full of energy and always said and did the right thing. But on the moments where he said and did the wrong thing, he learned from his mistakes. Like in Errand of Mercy, when when he was ready to uh, you know start a war with the Klingons, right? Yeah. You know, and then he sort of doubles back and says, Well, no one wants war, you know. Uh <laughs> Like I like moments like that, like in in Devil in the Dark when he he think we got to kill the Horda because the Horda's killing the miners and and we need this uh, this mining operation up and running. And then when he realizes that the Horda was a mother protecting its its kids, he goes, "We were wrong." Like I love moments like that. Mm-hmm. That this is like the star of your show. This is the captain, and he is not perfect. And even at this stage of his life, after all these years of of being uh, trained to hate the Klingons and then having a Klingon kill his son and just sort of like steeped him in his convictions. And now he's going, I was wrong. I love that. 
I, I just think that, that, that the moment of vulnerability like that is, is one of the things that I, I've always loved about Shatner's portrayal and, and the writers and the producers of the shows and the movies when they, when they put that vulnerability in him. It makes him relatable. So I feel exactly the same way. This is, I'm going to give a criticism of the film, which is exactly, this is the, if Steve were making the movie, this is what I would have done. Mm -hmm. My, my kind of issue with the film is that the emotional story of Captain Kirk is resolved here. The, the most emotionally profound things in the film from let them die. I never forgave them for the death of my son, the trial, the, the, you know, the Hitler 1938, all of that stuff is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And now we're 35, 40 minutes from the end of the movie. And that's kind of done as opposed to, if you look at star Trek two, He's still, after Spock's death, he's still struggling. He has a conversation with David about him not facing death. And it's only at the very end, in the last moments, how do you feel? I feel young. Mm -hmm. Like that resolves his emotional journey. And here, from this point forward, that emotional journey is is over. And and it's not, I like, I totally like the movie. Um, I love many, many parts of it, but that is sort of where I go. It It becomes from this point forward, less powerful than it was for the first two thirds of the film. That's really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. I disagree, but all right. I respect. No, I, I, I knew both. I, I assume yeah. both of you would disagree, but that's just how I've always felt about it. No, I, I, I listen, I, I thought that the thing that you dislike about this moment is what I disliked about the first two thirds of the film, mm. that, that he was so, you know, full of so much bitterness and hatred for the Klingons, the aspirational, Captain Kirk that inspired me my entire life. I want to see the the uh, the risk is our business. That's what the starship sure. is all about. That's the Kirk that inspired me my entire life to this very day. And I I don't like seeing Kirk as a broken man full of full of bigotry and hatred and bitterness. But when he gets to the point in the film where he realizes that he was wrong, I went, That that's my guy. There you go. Mm. Okay, well, good. He learned. So I, I figured out a better way to say it. I totally like that that's I was wrong moment. Mm -hmm. I don't like A, where it is, and B, what he has to do. And this is, this is sort of what I mean, is that if the issue is Kirk does not trust the Klingons, then the resolution of that issue should be Kirk having to trust a Klingon. Is that, and that doesn't really happen is that we don't really have any direct interactions with the Klingons from this point forward. You know, oh. is that, 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 and again, this is just Steve rewriting the movie. And, right, you but, know, it's- But it's, I disagree with you, because when he says, I didn't think to give Chancellor Gorgon right. his props, I think that's him in a way talking to the spirit of Chancellor Gorgon as, as the I agree. Klingon. He is the only Klingon who is remotely accessible to him. And later, when he has that moment after he saves the president and he has the moment with uh, Chancellor Gorkon's daughter, with Rosanna Soto, that's him kind of uh, totally. surrendering to her his mistake and his vulnerability and his his apology. So I think in that way, he does grow. Uh, um, and also the hallmark, also the conversation he has with Spock. When he's like, you you assume you have, e I have an ego or, or sorry, the co conversation they have where they talk about old yeah. age and what have you and yeah. letting go. Uh, and I think those are the things where he grows. But, you know, it's 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 subjective. Uh, uh, medium, totally. So, yeah. And I, I, I get that. And I, I, like I said, I like the movie. I'm going to say one more thing and then we'll leave yeah. it alone. Here's the movie I would make. Instead of it being Marta in the prison, it was a Klingon dissonant, and he has to team up with an actual Klingon to get out and support that person. That that it becomes like hell in the Pacific, or it becomes you know it's the the two people that shouldn't trust each other that trust each other. I would have done that as the as the third act of the film. That's okay. my movie. My All right, <laughs> let's move on because Marta has shown up, and a we're discussing you know, a jailbreak. And she says that basically she can get them out to the surface, but she thinks maybe he could get them off the surface. Um, and then she gives Kirk a big kiss. Mm -hmm. 
And then McCoy yeah. says, what is it with you anyway? Now, Steve, you don't you don't like that scene. That's old no. school Star Trek, man. I, I oh, love that. I love that Nye because, you know, too. it was like such a thing that Kirk always got the girl and everything. Yeah. And now here he's getting he's, it's a, he looks terrible, you know, and and, <laughs> and 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 she still gets the girl. And McCoy just goes, what is it with you anyway? I just thought it was great. I mean, this is the it's, yeah, a, it's hilarious. This is, it, this is the 25th anniversary of Star Trek, and they're having fun with it too. And the back and forth. Still think we're finished? More than ever. It's a great yeah. back and forth because Agreed. for the first time ever, one of the other crew members comments on the meta thing that people have been commenting for many yes. years after the Star Trek series finished that Kirk always seems to get the girl. And it's the first time in all the movies. Uh, that he's had this situation. Remember in Star Trek Two, it's the it's the breakup of them that is re-explored, but right. he doesn't get any other women throughout the entire six films. So he gets this one moment. If it's his last time, and that was the rumor playing Kirk, he gets. And remember though, she's um, manipulating him. She's kissing right. him because she's yeah. probably heard Kirk is easy to get mm. to if you make out with him and Straight if you're pretty point. and whatever. Because remember, she's a shapeshifter. So I think she's using her wiles to think that she's getting in with Kirk. Absolutely. In fact, she yes. isn't, which we you find know, out. One more thing to, to mention here, you know, uh, it's going just backing up a bit to to the more serious side of the conversation between Kirk and McCoy yeah. about being afraid of the future. I feel like some of the best dramatic moments from the original series happened between Kirk and McCoy. Now, the it, it's so embedded that that Star Trek is Kirk and Spock or Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Okay. I mean, really, it is Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Right. But but still people sort of gravitate to Kirk and Spock more than more than the relationship between Kirk and McCoy, especially after Spock died saving the Enterprise right. in Star Trek II, and then the mm. Enterprise dying in Star Trek III to return the favor. But if you look back in the original series, some of the most dramatic moments and some of them heated, but always honest, happened between Kirk and McCoy. Look at the uh, anytime you can bluff me, doctor moment from the Corbomite maneuver. Look at the why me discussion that they have in Balance of Terror. Look at the the, the conversation, the, the argument that they have in the cave in a private little war. Mm -hmm. When Kirk decides to arm the Hill people with flintlocks to establish a balance of power. like And then the ultimate computer where Kirk raises his glass to Captain Dunsell and McCoy corrects him and says to James T. Kirk, captain of the Enterprise. And here's a moment between Kirk and McCoy where Kirk is saying, I was afraid, no more neutral zone. But, but, but then he says someone else was more afraid. And that's it's just such a great moment because I felt like for that for that scene, Shatner and the Forrest Kelly were vested and connected and on the same page. And this was the Kirk and McCoy that that I loved for all those years. You know what just occurred to me is that here is this movie where we're kind of saying goodbye to all our characters and our two main relationships, Kirk McCoy and Kirk and Spock, have two intimate conversations in the dark mm. in this movie. Yeah. Mm. They're, they're very sort of similar moments. And speaking mm. of being in the dark and being in bed, we cut to the Excelsior where Captain Sulu is woken up by a very interesting officer. And I so remember seeing this in the movie theater and going, is that Christian Slater? I think yeah. that's Christian <laughs> Slater. Hey, that's Christian Slater. Starfleet urgently requests any data we have on the whereabouts of Enterprise. So he is not only a big Star Trek fan, but his mother, Mary Jo Slater, was mm -hmm. the casting director for Star Trek VI. Yep. So there is a little bit of nepotism there, but I applaud him for it because if you're a Star Trek fan and you want to be in a Star Trek movie, you do whatever it takes. And he did. <laughs> and, you know, the chutzpah, I'm with you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and God. to be honest, he's in dark. He's in the dark. So... That was his, I bet that was the exchange. We'll put you in it, but we'll, we don't want you to be the focus of the scene. So we'll put you in the little bit of dark. And I think in the original film, you could barely make it out that it was him and you'd have to judge by the voice. Uh, and I think yeah, it holds his, his face is, if his face is, it's not lit, yep. but his voice. And then when you see the close up, it's yeah. clear, it's, it's, it's obviously him, 
but they don't like it. Like you're right, John. They don't like shine a big light on him and, yeah. you know, make him look good. He's, he's, he's shadowed. Yeah. The light is on Sulu who's in his bed at the same time. While I like that scene, I, it took me out of the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I understand that. Okay. Yeah, I, I like as, as cameos go, I, I, I enjoyed that one. We're back on the enterprise and we're starting to make some progress. Chekhov finds some blood on the transporter, which we know is Klingon blood. We're expanding the search to include uniforms. They find one of the boots and Valeris triumphantly sticks the magnetic boot to the metal locker. It's a great, great moment. I, I really like how they handle the mystery here. Um, we're back to the mines and the plan with Marta was to meet, to go down to the seventh level or something like that in the morning. And they get into this elevator. And by the way, the way they make this elevator move, that elevator doesn't move. What they have <laughs> is a canvas on a reel that is rolling behind the elevator to make it look like it's moving. It's just sitting in one place and there's a big person in the elevator with them and they're looking around going where's marta i think we've been had and then we hear marta's voice coming out of this alien get off at the first level follow the gang into the mine they don't take girls and back on the enterprise we found the guy we found the person whose locker that shoe was in and check off in a very confident way mentions the russian epic of cinderella if shoe fits wear it it doesn't go the way he expects it to go. <laughs> yeah, they got the wrong guy. Because <laughs> they gesture, all the other crew is kind of going, look at his feet. And we look down and he has feet that will clearly not fit into that boot. Back in the mines, we see that Marta is a shapeshifter. And she morphs into this blonde girl who easily takes off the chains. And then they get through this tunnel. She turns back into the big alien and we got to climb up out of here. They do. They go past the frozen dude that we saw on the surface. I love, by the way, that they color corrected this whole thing purple. It all has kind of a purple tint, which mm -hmm. Nicholas Myers was like, that's the alien world has different light, which I think is a good choice. And we're walking in the snow. This is all shot second unit. So we don't have, this isn't Kirk and McCoy in a, on a glacier. It's the colony glacier in Alaska. And then all the close-ups were shot in studio. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's no way Shatner anymore going to Alaska to, to walk on a glacier for yeah. a, a distant uh, uh, <laughs> B-roll shot, so to speak. And of course, as soon as they come up on the surface, suddenly on the Enterprise, they can see where they are. They've got a trace on them. Um, and I love Spock's line here. Mr. Shepard, what's required now is a feat of linguistic ledger domain and a degree of intrepidity. <laughs> I had to look up Ledger Domain. <laughs> that, that, that is the skillful use of hands while performing conjuring tricks. Oh. As with, yeah. Interped, intrepidity means courage and dauntlessness. That one I kind of knew. But Ledger Domain was like, like, man, that is a big word. Um, and then we have the moment in the snow where McCoy falls and says, leave me, I'm finished. And that's when Kirk tells him about the Viridian patch. And by the way, that this, moment reminded me of all our yesterdays where Spock and McCoy went uh, mm, back yeah. back in time, you know, using the Atavacron uh, on Sarpedon to go back to the Ice Age of that planet. And they couldn't get back through the Atavacron to get back into the library with uh, Mr. Ataz. Uh, and anybody listening, you know exactly what episode I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, that was the second to the last episode of Star Trek ever filmed for the original series. So that scene mm. in Star Trek VI reminded me of this scene from All Our Yesterdays in the original series. By the way, I just have to point out the level of Scott Mance's geekitude is like, I probably could have come, when you said the, the episode, I knew what episode you're talking about. <laughs> I probably could have come up with Mr. Atos and the Tavacron, maybe, maybe. But the fact that you know the name of the planet that they were on, that is a ridiculous level of trivia <laughs> knowledge that Sarpedon. impresses me. Sarpedon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never would have gotten that. And, and actually, uh, just to go one step further in the geekiness, uh, all our yesterdays was the uh, the sixth Star Trek photo novel to be released by uh, Mandalay Productions in uh, 1977. So, wow, you want a geek? You got him, baby. <laughs> <You're the full laughs> geek. <laughs> Back on the Enterprise is a very silly scene that is funny and silly. 
which is them trying to talk their way past the Klingon oh, yeah. outpost and having to speak Klingon. And they say, you know, uh, we can't use universal translator because they'll 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 hear our voices being translated. And they're looking at a whole bunch of books and and, and doing a terrible job speaking Klingon. And, you know, and then they do a Klingon laugh to laugh with the other people and they totally get away with it. They get away with it, but barely. Uh, you know what? I, he, the scene's amusing to an extent. I okay. Here's the thing: when you have a movie <laughs> that that shifts tones, yeah, yeah, where the shift in tones, like it, it makes the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Like, for example, an American Werewolf in London is a movie that shift to, shifts tones. It when it's scary, it's really scary. When it's funny, it's really funny. When it's romantic, it's really romantic. And then it goes back to being a big old scary werewolf movie again. And at no point does one tone interfere with another. Mm. Uh, look at the movie Argo, directed by Ben Affleck. The stuff in Iran is very, very intense. Yep. And yet the stuff in Hollywood, where they're trying to mount this fake science fiction film, is really funny. And it's almost like a satire of Hollywood. I love that movie. But at no point does the tone in the Hollywood stuff interfere with the intensity and the right. suspense of the Iran setting. Hmm. But with this scene in Star Trek VI, you know, Kirk and McCoy are freezing. They're trying to get off Rorpenthe, and it's the Enterprise to the rescue. And this moment of levity diffuses the suspense. Hmm. It diffuses the race against time. It diffuses the drama. I mean, I get... I, you know, I guess it was amusing, like when I was when I was, you know, 30 years younger and I saw this movie when I was uh, uh, 22, not 52. But I, I actually not crazy about the scene. I wish it, uh, if I either wasn't there or they did something a little more dramatic. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a great point, Scott, because at this point we've been through, s what, five and a half of these films as we head towards the <laughs> yeah. end of six. And this feels like a cheat that maybe could have been in the first film, you know, because of some of the things that could have get away with. But now that we've established uh, this world so powerfully, this scene seems so impossible to get away with. Um, and you really would question that Spock hasn't learned how to speak Klingon at this point. I think well, that's uh, the, yeah. right? I, I, I mean, yeah. Spock is so intense. He's essentially the C-3PO in essence, uh, it, you know, uh, of the Star Trek world. You would imagine, especially because his dad's an ambassador, especially because he's been on the ship for how many years fighting Klingons for how many years? Everybody in intelligence in the U.S. knows how to speak Russian, Chinese, whoever is where our main enemies are, you've got to learn how to speak the language so you can interpret any any missives or, or, or things you might uh, catch or, or, or documents or whatever. So it's shocking that it isn't Spock doing it. And, and also, also from what I remember reading, I mean, you know, this was a really, really long time ago. I believe that Michelle Nichols didn't mm. like this scene because she felt like as the communications officer. Right, she would she, know. Yeah. She, right, that she would have been able to figure out either how to just say what needed to be said or to manipulate the communications console so that they could translate it without it being detected by the Klingons. So mm -hmm. I, mean, I might be wrong if anybody's listening that can correct us otherwise, please feel free to do so. But for what I remember vaguely, Michelle Nichols was not crazy about this scene. Here, here's what, why I think it, because I agree with everything you both have said, and that to me, this seems like the director or the screenwriter or the producer or whoever going, I have a funny idea for a scene. Yeah. Rather yeah. than having the humor come out of the situation. So Star Trek Four, I would say is, you know, I think everyone would agree is the funniest of the films. But all the humor comes out of our characters acting like our characters in their situations. Mm -hmm. You know, Chekhov asking where the nuclear vessels are in a, with a Russian yeah. accent is They're funny. in Alameda. They're in Alameda. Yeah. That's what I said, <laughs> Alameda. <laughs> um, the, the, like the scene where Spock nerve pinches the punk rocker on the bus is funny and everyone claps, but it's within who their characters are. Yeah. Why the hell are there a bunch of huge books on the Enterprise? Like this was your best plan. This plan doesn't make any sense. Because you know at least- You know why, why there were books on the Enterprise? 
because Samuel T. Cogley <laughs> loves books. That's right. He um, loves books, and he left all those books on the Enterprise just to mess with Captain Kirk after court martial. <laughs> Again, only on the cinephiles will there be not one but two Samuel T. Cogley <laughs> references. <laughs> So we have a, a flare to warm us up in the middle of the snow. And I, this moment is great. She says, well, we're outside the shield. Now it's your turn, Captain. And he says, if you say so, and punches her right in the face. Ah! Yep. Because Kirk is smart and he has figured out that this is a setup. The clothes, the flare, you're trying to get a shot while trying to escape. And then, and this I do not like, because it's a reference to me to a very cheesy episode of Star Trek <laughs> is she turns into Kirk. And I don't like the jokes. What? I oh, don't like them at all. Really? I yeah. love them. Can't believe I kissed you. Must have been your lifelong ambition. They seem like jokes about Shatner, not jokes about yeah, Kirk. But it's the last one in the series and the rumor was he wasn't going to come back. So it's a funny little meta moment in this sequence. But I mean, I, I respect you don't like it. I love it when he's like- Now, now do we ever establish that uh, Marta is from the same race as Odo from Star Trek Deep Space Nine? Ooh, mm. I don't know. Like, has that ever been brought up because Ooh. they're, Odo is a shapeshifter and Marta is a shapeshifter? Good like, question. I, I don't know if that's been brought up, but uh, I mean, Marta in her natural form is a lot prettier than <laughs> Rene Aubergeois was How as dare Odo you? in Deep Space Nine. He's a very pretty man. <laughs> I'm a, a good-looking man. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> By the way, good. Rene Aubergeois does have a very small role in Star Trek VI. So speaking of Oh, which, yeah, that's right. Yeah, remember? He's like the general. He has like the plan and the map and the, yes. you know, the, Federation, uh, the Federation president with the, you know, wild hair and the groovy glasses, you know, uh, the guy from RoboCop. Uh, what's his yeah. name? Kurtwood Kurt Smith. Smith. Kurtwood yeah. Smith. Oh, Kurtwood Smith was such an asshole in um, uh, the movie with Robin Williams. Dead Poet Society. Dead oh, Poets, he was yeah. such an asshole in that yeah. movie. He made a He's always an movies. asshole. Yeah, yeah. Until the 70s shows. Until 70s that 70s show. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, our two Kirks fight each other and you know roll over McCoy at one point and then there's one of those big scary dogs from Rorapente and they are surrounded by Klingons and we have that moment of kill him he's the one not me you idiot him and the one they shoot is Marta leaving Kirk alive when that movie was was about to come out in 1991 there were tv commercials where you see the the laser shot on Kirk and Kirk disintegrates. Mm, so of course, nobody has seen. That. Yeah, I remembered that. And and like I went, okay, this is like when they showed the commercial for Star Trek Three back in 1984, and it said the final voyage of the Starship Enterprise, and you see the Enterprise like right. you know after it's already blown up. So now Star Trek Six is about to come out, and there's a scene where you see Kirk getting shot, and it's like a phaser on 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 uh, disintegrate, and you see Kirk disintegrating like he's just been shot. And I went. Oh my God. Oh, and you go, oh my God. Someone shot Captain Kirk and he disappeared. But ah, you tricked me, you sons of bitches. <laughs> that was Marta. That was not Captain Kirk. And then you have the very silly moment of Kirk basically asking, well, who's behind this? And the bad guy saying, well, since I'm about to kill you anyway, the <laughs> person well tell you. <laughs> and yeah. then they get beamed up. <laughs> Yeah, like it's, it's, right, the first five is, and then they're getting beamed up. And actually, I think this is actually pretty funny. Yes, I think it's funny. They're, think they're, it's they're really coming on. They're they're beaming up. They have saved Kirk and McCoy. Like Spock and the Enterprise to the rescue. They saved Kirk and McCoy, and Kirk is beaming forward. Going, no, don't, don't, no, no. Because, yeah, the, yeah. The look on Leonard Nimoy's face. You know, he's like, what? <laughs> they like they it. wait another they second. Yeah. Like, I, I like, well, do you want me to send you back? <laughs> like, no. No. He's like, no, um, it's cold. <laughs> cut to Scotty, and he finds the uniforms, the missing uniforms we're looking for. Now, wait, um, Scotty, it's it's Scotty is in is in the briefing room. And what is he doing? He's doing what he always did. He's reading his technical journals. <laughs> yeah. Remember back in the trouble with Tribbles? Sure, of when Kirk confined him to quarters after the breakout between the, the Enterprise crew and the Klingons on Space Station K7. And he goes, 
Uh, Again, K7, I would never have remembered. Space Station K7. (laughs) And he goes, uh, Scotty, you're confined. You're restricted to quarters until further notice. And he goes, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That'll give me a chance to catch up on my technical journals. So here he is. Here is Scotty reading his technical journal. And I was watching the movie for the first time going, oh, this is a nod to the trouble with Tribbles. And thinking... I wonder if anybody else in this theater is going to get that. Or maybe I'm just reading too far into it. And here I am 30 years later, still reading too far into it, because that is what we do on the cinephiles. <laughs> By the way, you just made the first moment ever that I went, oh, maybe I'm kind of like Scotty. I always, you know, like you go, who's start, which Star Trek character are you? It's like, if I was worried about, you know, the pandemic going on and I had to isolate myself in my office for a few days, it'd be like, oh, I could just read a bunch of books. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then after finding the uniforms, we find the dead crew members right away. Mm-hmm. They've been murdered and we hear the first rule of assassination, kill the assassins. And they were not vaporized because we know that would set off an alarm. But apparently if you hold a phaser on stun on someone for a long time, it'll kill them, which is interesting. Oh, wow. Um, but then they come up with an idea. And we, and Kirk whispers something, and we hear the announcement. Court reporter to City Bay. Statement to be taken at once from Yeoman Burke and Asando. And we're in the dark, and a door opens, and a person moves in with a phaser. It's in Sick Bay. In Sick Bay, moving towards a body with blankets over it. And then Spock turns on the light, and the person with the phaser is Valeris. You have to shoot. Are logical. You have to shoot. And then on the other table, under the covers, lifting over the covers, because Valeris has her phaser aimed at Spock, and Kirk says, I just assumed you didn't. Now, this is a really good dramatic scene. Yeah. Uh, there's no levity here. This is serious. Yeah. Smacks and, the phaser out of her hand. And right. Ah, oh, the way Spock smacks that phaser out of Valeris's hand. He is showing emotion. He is mm-hmm. showing emotion of disgust yeah. because of this person that he trusted. And again, if only this had been Sadik played by, yeah. by Kirstie Alley. Can you imagine the impact that moment would have had that the reveal of the of the Judas on the Enterprise was Sadik? Yeah. However... I'm not taking anything away from this moment because Kim Cattrall was great in this role. I agree. Oh, yeah. She was terrific in this scene. Yeah, Spock's Spock's anger is is absolutely shocking and terrifying. And she's saying, you know, you can't prove anything. Yeah, we're right? on the bridge, you know, because yeah. because Valaris is standing, Valaris oh, yeah. is standing in front of the view screen, and Kirk is standing in front of his chair, and everybody's looking at Valaris. It's it's a very dramatic location and setup. It doesn't really make sense to me that they're doing this on the bridge with her standing in front of the view screen. It seems like an odd choice, but it's really dramatic the way it's set up. And there is this moment where Valeris says to Spock, I tried to tell you, but you would not listen. Neither of us was hearing very well that night, Lieutenant. That line is the line that makes me go, are you implying that they had sex with each other? Like, mm, is that what mm, that means? Maybe. I never thought movie. about that. I thought I thought when they were having that toast and he says, I intend for you to replace me. And she says, I could only succeed you. Yeah. I thought that that's where that conversation ended. I didn't realize that there was a, a, a it was an allusion to something more intimate happening after we cut away from that scene. But that is the only thing now that makes sense. Yep. Because... Yep. What else could he be referring to? Because they were having a very, you know, profound conversation and very much in tune with what they were saying. But you could also argue that there was definitely a, 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 an attraction intellectual, of course, Mm -hmm. but I never thought about that all these years. I never thought that Valeris and Spock might've, you know, crossed the line. John, you sort of brought this up in our first part, talking about their relationship. I've always felt that that line was a reference to them having sex. Uh, And I just, 
just kind of accepted it and moved forward. Um, because Kirk, because Star Trek's not going to show Spock having sex or making out with That's not really a Spock thing. You oh, know? he did. They, they actually, he did do that in the Enterprise incident. There is the scene where, the where, right, right. right, yeah, where, where, you know, you see Spock making out with the Romulan commander. And it's, you know, it's just by the touch of their hands. Right. And it's very, very sensual. Yeah. Uh, it, you, you know, even for. But- 1968 but anyway sorry go yeah. ahead. but doesn't he have one scott also in the series and steve like where he he's like being he's like changing who he is and he's like you know kissing on the nurse or whatever isn't there a makeout scene with the nurse or well, something i think there's something with that with him too so well the, the, a lot of uh when you when you see spock like engaging in romance in, in a uh, uh an act of romance like that humans would do yeah he was often he was often under some kind of an influence. Yeah. Mind altering or do it. Yeah. yeah. Like whether it was the spores in the side of right, paradise the spores, right. or reverting back to his more, uh, you know, his ancestors mm. in, uh, in, again, in our yesterdays when or he went yesterday. back in time. So, yeah. Yeah. So, that, and, um, you know, so yes, that he did do moments like that, but not as a, as a Vulcan, it was right. more like it was between, Spock and the Romulan commander in the Enterprise. Right. Incident. It's subtle. And especially and especially because he's an older man, Leonard D. Boy, it would have looked weird to have him, you know, make it out with Kim Cattrall, who's still relatively young at this time. So to me, oh. I think that's where I, I would not have been. So it's more noble that they don't show it and it's alluded to by a sentence. Like Spock and the touching of the hands you mentioned, Scott. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost like someone might find it looked a little weird for an older man like, like Shatner to make out with a much younger person like Iman. She's right? a shapeshifter. <laughs> and Kirk's always making out women, so it's a different True. situation. And the next moment is yeah. between the next moment is between Kirk and Valeris, and this is the one I sort of bumped on for the first time the last time watching it, where she says, "Klingons cannot be trusted." You said so yourself. They killed your son. Did you not wish Gorkon dead? Let them die. You said. Did I misinterpret you? And in that moment, Kirk, somewhat shocked, sits down, and that's the watching this last time is the first time I went. Wait, is he overhearing Kirk say that what made Valeris make the choice to join the conspiracy and have the murder, the assassination of Gorkin? No, I think that Valeris was part of it, yeah. was part of the plan, yeah, way before, way before, uh, you know, he had yeah. that moment in, in, in his quarters. I agree but, because he puts those two crew members, she puts those two crew members on the ship, you would imagine, right, to yeah. commit the assassination. Th- yeah. This was this had to have been thought out and thought through for a long, long time. Right. But and you know, Kirk heard his words used against him during the trial. And now here she is on the bridge of the Enterprise in front of his crew, saying, Let them die, you said. Mm, and yeah. hearing Valeris throw his ugly words back in his mm. face. I thought Shatner played this perfectly. He looked down in shame and he Mm. sat down in his chair because he knew that she was right. Mm -hmm. That for that that particular instance of that conversation, she was right. Let them die, you said. And he just was realizing just how very, very, very wrong he was and how ashamed he was to say, let them die. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great, he didn't have to say anything. It was all in his action, the way he looked down and his shoulders became kind of hunched over and he just sat down in shame. She got him. In the next moment, they're trying to get information out of her. They're not getting the information out of her. Spock advances on her, oh, pulls Valeris to him violently with a lot of force and brings his hand to her face. And of course, we all know what this is. This is the Vulcan mind meld, but done in a way unlike anything we've ever seen in Star Trek. The situation is set up. They're running out of time. They need to get this information. I don't know if I agree with you. It's violent. It's a strong yank. Uh, And then the um, hand goes on her face. But it is a violation irregardless. It's a violation of her physical space and her mind. It, it, it is it is such an intense scene. Yeah, it's a level of interrogation that Spock uses, using his 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 Vulcan abilities that we have never, in a way that we've never seen him do before. Mm-hmm. The most difficult sort of mind meld 
that we saw previously with Spock. Nomad. I was going to say Nomad, but uh, with a human, okay? Oh. Because, you know, Nomad was definitely a very uh, powerful moment from the Changeling. But the scene in the Paradise Syndrome, after the Enterprise returns to the, the planet with the, the Native Americans, basically. Mm. and Oh, with Kirk. Yeah, yeah. Kirok. So after they beam back down to the planet to find Captain Kirk and he's wearing the Native American attire because his, he lost his memory and Spock uses the mind meld to bring James T. Kirk back. And he's screaming, I am Kirok, I'm Kirok. And it is, that's, that's a different level of intensity. But the intensity of the, the mind meld between Spock and Valeris She's like, so she, she really doesn't know. I mean, he's trying to get it out of her in a way that he, he violates her. Yes. I mean, Very he much. violates her and she's screaming uh, uh, because she doesn't have it in her. And he's reached down so far into her that he's violated her. And then he breaks the mind meld. And what's the way Spock says, does not know. His voice cracks, almost like oh, it, it's yeah, yeah, like it's it took something out of him, mm -hmm. and he was winded, and and uh, I want to say emotional. Yeah, I'd I'd go even farther that in that moment he grasps the violation that he's just committed. Yeah, that's because, what I think too. Right, yeah. Steve, because she's heard. Yeah. Her, by the way, this is an incredible acting moment by Kim Cattrall. Yep. The fact that she never got more dramas, uh, really prestige dramas to show what she could do as an actress, uh, it will always be a shame because this moment, this scene alone is incredible. The, the, the gasps are, once again, this is the darkest Star Trek film. For all the jokes and crazy scenes or weird scenes, this is a very dark moment. This it is. is. Uh, your heroes violating a person here, especially your top hero, your really unimpeachable hero in Spock, violating her mental space and her own physical being to get information out of her. And even when, even, and I love this Nicholas Meyer or the editor includes the cut to Uhura yeah. and Uhura as a sympathetic woman is grabbing her chest or grabbing her hand near her chest, feeling mm -hmm. uh, this or commiserating with this violation, relating, perhaps, relating, yeah, relating she, she's as, relating to it, relating, yeah. yeah, as maybe other women would relate to a situation because they've experienced it or they've seen someone go through it or heard someone go through it, and it's so powerful. So when he goes, she does not know there is such a destruction inside of him mm -hmm. for how far he was willing to go, and maybe there's a question too for him later on down the road of how much he really is committed to the Federation if it pushes him to do something like this, which well, I think. Well, is great. The, the, the thing that uh, that we mentioned in part one of mm -hmm. this episode of the cinephiles on Star Trek VI is that Gene Roddenberry saw a version of this movie just two days before he passed away. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, as we were talking in part one about how Roddenberry saw the film and he he didn't like how, how dark and militaristic the Federation looked, it didn't ever even occur to me until talking about this particular scene to think, what did Roddenberry think of yeah. this scene in mm -hmm. particular right. to see? Now, now, on the other hand, Roddenberry was the day-to-day -day producer on the original series when they did The Enemy Within, which featured oh, yeah. the very first, one of the very first rape scenes ever on network television mm -hmm. when the uh, Dark Kirk tried to uh, have his way with Yeoman Rand. So, mm -hmm. so that is a violation that... Roddenberry had on a show that he was producing and it was something that was very uh, uh, tabooed in a sense that had never been done on TV before. Right. But in terms of the way that, you know, Kirk was not himself or, or fully himself in that episode, but in the terms of, of what Spock does to try and get information out of Valeris, the way he violates her. I mean, this is the Spock that we know and love mm -hmm. and he's doing this. I agree. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, two things I would add. The first is that for me, because there's a moment I think where Spock makes the choice to move from mind meld to torture, essentially. Mm. Like he knows when he brings that second hand up that yes. it's going to hurt. 
Yep. And she screams and the knowledge that he did that and got nothing that he, it was unnecessary to do mm. that because in fact she'd given all the names, but she didn't know the location of the peace conference. That just makes it even worse. Here's yeah. one more thing. So, you know, I listen to the commentary track and there are times and we've come across them many times on this show where the director will say something about a scene and you're like, that is not what I saw at all. Mm -hmm. This is what Nick Myers said about this scene. He says the scene was meant to be erotic. It's sexy stuff. Mm. That's not what I saw. That's not, not what I saw. I, I don't know how you're doing, Nicholas, but I don't think you're doing it right if she's screaming like that. That was not erotic in any way, shape, or form. Well, and particularly, I mean, the scream, obviously, but the cut to a horror, John, as you point out, yeah. that very, that's where a reaction shot tells you yeah. how to feel about what's happening. And it is clearly torture, rape, a violation. That is yeah. clearly what's happening. So I don't know what Nicholas Meyer was thinking in that <laughs> moment. Um, it's always strange, but we didn't get the information there. So we're going to call up Excelsior and, and cause they, they know where the peace conference is. I love the moment where Kirk says to Captain Sulu, you realize that by even talking to us, you're violating regulations. I'm sorry, Captain, your message is breaking up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, great. Yeah. I love that conversation. You know, Kirk and Sulu are talking to each other, captain to captain, not, not captain to navigator, yeah. Yeah. captain to captain. Mm -hmm. Kirk is beaming with pride at captain Sulu of the starship Excelsior. Totally. And Sulu is beaming with pride back at his, at his mentor for all these years. Now we're talking about, you know, Kirk and Sulu, not Shatner and George <laughs> Takei. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a great moment. Thank you, Captain Sulu. Don't mention it, Captain Kirk. Like I just, I just got yeah. me in the heart. You yeah. know, it just the the years that they that Kirk and Sue had shared together just just were was in the inflection of their voices that yeah. that they were both so like oh my god, I, it's it's Captain Kirk, it's Mister Sue. I I miss you. You know, I miss yeah. you too. It's a great moment. If you're a lover of Star Trek, you know the biggest heartbreak is the the division between Takai and Shatter. It's yeah, just absolutely. It's heartbreaking because you're like, why can't these two gentlemen, these two alpha males, why can't they figure it out in the end? And you can find fault on both sides. And yeah. that's the thing that's really hard. And this scene is so genuine, so it real. Is. And yeah. you're just like, why can't they do this? You know? Mm -hmm. I agree. And now we've reached a scene that both of you have mentioned multiple times throughout this show. And that is in the dark, Kirk, and Spock and it's a really it's a really really interesting scene in which basically both of them admit to being wrong you were right it was arrogant presumption on my part that got us into this situation you and the doctor might have been killed the light is young they are having a very private moment between two long-standing Starfleet officers held with such high regard and they are facing a crossroads not just in their in their lives but in a crossroad in, in the very in the very existence of the federation and do they fit with where things are going mm. are they too old have they outlived their usefulness mm. will they be forgotten will they be set cast aside Will they be able to pivot and adapt to this brave new world where the Federation and the Klingons will become allies, which is something that the Oregonians said to Kirk and oh. Spock in Errand of Mercy. It is true that in the future, you and the Klingons will become fast friends. You will work together. Never. But he didn't say when. That moment has now come. And it might be too late for Kirk and Spock unless they shape up and now is the time. I love that they each kind of point out their mistakes. Couldn't get past the death of my son. I was prejudiced by her accomplishments as a Vulcan. It's so interesting because it's, it's a kind of screenwriting that I would call parallel conversation. Is they're each saying a monologue, essentially, intercut with the other's monologue. 
And each monologue, each point is how, even though they're very different people, they were essentially doing the same thing. Um, and I love this moment where Kirk says, they're a great one for logic. I'm a great one for rushing in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> I think that's a great assessment of who they are. Is it possible that we too, you and I, have grown so old and so inflexible that we have outlived our usefulness? <laughs> that's the lie. Like that, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, John and I just did a short, uh, mm. and one of the questions that someone asked about uh, uh, Coppola was how come he made these amazing films in the seventies and then maybe lesser films later. And he got off the boat. yeah, he got <laughs> off the boat. Um, but like this idea of, have we grown too so old and inflexible that we have outlived our usefulness? I think that relates. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it relates to so many people now at a time when when the world is at its own crossroads mm. for so many reasons, because of the way this pandemic and everything that happened during the course of the pandemic, uh, whether it was uh, the death of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and now as, as we record this with the rise in Asian hate crimes mm. that were brought on by a president who kept referring to the coronavirus in his words, I'm using his yeah. words, he kept saying it, it was the Chinese, uh, the Chinese flu. Uh, and stir stirring the hate. And we as a, as a species are at this moment, I mean, I know I'm really reading into this here, but we as a species are at this crossroads mm. because the world is never going to be the same. Now, I know, I, I know that a lot of people said that about 9-11, but 9-11 was on 9-11. It was a moment. Mm. This has been a year and bigotry and hatred, whether it's to black Americans, Asian Americans, uh, whatever is, it's, it's all come to a head. Mm. And this is our moment as a species to embrace this future where it is going, it, it has to be different in order for our survival. Yeah. Just like, just like for for Kirk and Spock, they have to uh, embrace this new future for the survival of of the Federation and the the Klingons. Mm -hmm. um, it's life comes down to a few moments. That's a quote from Wall Street. This is one of them, and this is a a moment. That that somehow resonates today in 2021 because we are all at a, a a massive massive crossroads, you know, trying to you know uh, do away with with the past, you know, letting go of the of the anchors that have weighed us down, whether it's bigotry or war, and that's what's happening in Star Trek VI, but also about embracing new ways of doing things. And I think that that's something that certainly the three of us at our stage of our lives are desperately trying to do. Where do we fit, especially in this business, show yeah. business? Mm -hmm. Like, where do we fit moving forward? Because it's not going to be like it was in the good old days. Yeah. There's so much great stuff in what you said. And, and, and it made me suddenly reconcile something that I hadn't been able to reconcile before. And it's something, Scott, you brought up many, many times is how is it that the person from Corbamite and, you know, Aaron Mercy and all these places where he learned he was wrong become this person who's so prejudiced? And I think this line, is it possible you and I have grown so old and flexible, is the, is the key is that the fact is it never gets easy to see when you're wrong. It never gets easier to question your principles. And in fact, the older you get, the more likely you are to go, no, I got it. Mm -hmm. And so the, the need to continually look at yourself and look at your prejudices, and we all have them, and try and to struggle against them, that is, that is how you get to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, the, the last moment of the scene is really interesting, too, because they're talking about, you know, who's responsible and that Kirk 
you know, and Spock saying he's responsible and that Kirk said as the captain, he was responsible for the crew. And then Kirk says, I was just captain of the ship, human beings. But captain, we both know that I am not human. Spock, you wanna know something? Everybody's human. I think that is such a fascinating line because the line that it makes, it makes me think of two other moments. The first moment is, of course, what just happened at the dinner scene. Listen to yourself, human rights, unalienable, even your language is racist. So that's one. But the other one is... Of my friend, I can only say this. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most... human. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The funeral for Spock in Star Trek II, he describes the guy who has been trying his whole life to be purely Vulcan as the most human. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And that that's that's two, not just two actors, but two characters talking from a very, very deep, deep history shared between them. And that's one of the things that gives this movie such a satisfying feeling of finality to it. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's come full circle. Like you, you had the scene on the, on Rora Penthe between Kirk and McCoy. And now you had the scene in Spock's quarters between Kirk and Spock. Like everybody's, they're working their stuff out. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very satisfying, especially for anyone who has been watching Star Trek since 1966, or anyone like from from our age group, the three yeah. of us, who were a little, you know, too young to have seen it on NBC, <laughs> but caught it during the syndication years, mm -hmm. which was really the period of time where Star Trek found its calling. We have reached the where the peace conference is. We know that there is a cloaked bird of prey out there that can fire while, while cloaked. We know that an assassination attempt is gonna happen at this peace treaty meeting. We see that we actually cut down there and see speeches going on. And then we hear out of the darkness. I can see you, Kirk. Chang. Can you see me? Oh, it's great. It's great. It's a great moment because you hear him before you see him. Oh, now be honest, Captain. Warrior to warrior. You do prefer it this way, don't you? As it was meant to be. <laughs> like Chang is where he wants to be. He is in his element. He's on a Klingon bird of prey and he's cloaked and he is ready to kick the crap out of the Enterprise. No peace in our time. Once more unto the breach, dear friends. <laughs> Now, first of all, Once More Into the Breach, of course, is Henry V, which, mm -hmm. which he acted in, Christopher Plummer acted in with William Shatner. The <laughs> other line, the other line, Peace in Our Time, is a reference to Neville Chamberlain, yep. Prime Minister of Great Britain, during the, right as the World War II is about to begin, because he appeased Hitler. And what's so interesting to me about using that line is that the year that he said that line is 1938, the wow. same year that Kirk is talking about Hitler, 1938. Mm -hmm. And later on, Chang quotes essentially um, Neville Chamberlain appeasing Hitler from 1938. Wow. Good, good observation. And the Klingon ship fires and hits. And the, we reverse engines trying to back off and there's kind of a pause. Now, uh, now what's great in this scene is, is Kirk is in the captain's chair. And this is, this is what happens when you have an actor playing a character for 25 years or 26 years, if you include where no man has gone before. Like the way Kirk is, you know, the Enterprise is hit by, uh, by a torpedo from the, the cloaked bird of prey. Kirk, you know, is, is in his chair. He's barking out orders and he goes, you know, back off, back off. But up to this point, the Enterprise was just sort of like going through the motions, doing what it had to do to – to have the Klingons aboard and all that stuff. And then it, you know, went to Rarapente to save Kirk and Sp Kirk and McCoy. But, you know, now it's like all battle stations. Okay. And the, the battle scene between the clothed bird of prey and the enterprise, which is getting hammered and pounded where the shields are giving way. I, I, you know, 
the Enterprise, even though this was Enterprise A, not the Enterprise from the original series, not the Enterprise from the motion picture or the Wrath of Khan, it's the Enterprise. And it just really took a big licking at this in this part of the film. Totally. Mm -hmm. This is where, again, I know I'm sorry that I keep having small criticisms, but to me, like the battle with the Reliant in Star Trek II is unbelievably great. And even the battles in Balance of Terror with the cloaked Romulan ship, Kirk's doing all this stuff. And here, the, why is the Enterprise just sitting here? Why aren't there evasive maneuvers? Why aren't they firing? Why aren't they? They're just getting hit. You know, it just seems like there was more that could have been done for me. Well, well wait a minute. In, in, defense of, in defense of this scene, the pursuit of the Romulan bird of prey in in uh, Balance of Terror, there was so much of a strategic move, like to to mirror the movements of the Romulan, so that the Romulans would think it's just a, a, an echo of their own right. ship. It, it was it was way more strategic in Balance of Terror, and and also, even though Kirk and Chang are definitely rivals and arch enemies. The relationship between Kirk and the Romulan commander on Balance of Terror was more of what, like they respected each other. They were inside each other's heads. Mm. Each one knew what the other was thinking. It was a different battle plan. I mean, you know, the Enterprise, it, it's too late for the Enterprise to, to play the run silent, run deep aspect mm. that it did in Balance of Terror. That, that episode really is run silent, run deep in space. But, you know, this is just... Like the, the gig is up, the Enterprise, it's 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 there. The Klingon bird of prey is running circles around it because it's cloaked and it can do that. And Chang is having a blast playing Absolutely. with Kirk. He oh, yeah. could not be happier. This is what he wants. And this is what he wants to continue this aggressiveness between the Federation and the Klingons, because this is what he wants. He thinks Kirk's wants that wants this too. He said, "Admit it. This is what you what you wanted." And as much as I think there was more that could have been done in terms of the battle, because I wanted because we set up Chang and Kirk as these are the greatest warriors, and I'm seeing what Chang's doing. I wish Kirk had was doing more. But what totally makes this sequence unbelievably great, man, Christopher Plummer, quoting Shakespeare, just chewing up every single moment he has on screen, you know, from quoting, again, I think the, the choices of Shakespeare that he's quoting is great. Tickle us, do we not laugh? Trick us, do we not bleed? Wrong us, shall we not revenge? Which is a monologue about racism in a play that happens to be very anti-Semitic, mm. but is still a monologue about where essentially what Kirk said in the scene a few scenes before, we're all human. Quoting Julius Caesar, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. It's not just that he quotes it, it's the way he says it. He twirls around in his chair. He is having the time of his life. This is exactly what he wanted. Yeah, it's awesome. It's just completely awesome. At the same time, we have the Excelsior is speeding its way towards Camp Kittimer to come to the rescue. Sulu is like, come on, come on faster. And this navigator says, uh, she'll fly apart. And he goes, fly her apart then. <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome. And then we figure out the solution, which is that even if it's cloaked, it's got to let out some gas. It's got, and I love what Hora says. Well, the thing's got to have a tailpipe. Doctor, would you care to assist me in performing surgery on a torpedo? Fascinating. 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 Great. <laughs> the battle is continuing. The speeches down on the surface are continuing. We're working on the torpedo. Kirk is calling for it. It's not quite ready. The shields are collapsing. A huge torpedo blast just tears through the saucer of, of the Enterprise. Really, really scary. And we hear, and of course, Plummer is continuing to quote Shakespeare. I am constant as the northern star. I'd give real money if he'd shut up. But at the same time, on Camp Kittimer, you're, you're having these speeches go on while you see a Klingon carry a briefcase out of the conference uh, area and into a stairwell so it could go up to the highest point in the area and he is basically putting together a rifle to assassinate the Federation president mm -hmm. as he's giving his speech. So 
this is like a race against time. And the suspense and the tension is really terrific. Like rewatching the movie, I thought Nicholas Meyer did a great job directing the scene. It's not quite as effective or as, as beautifully staged as the Battle of the Mutara Nebula in mm. Wrath of Khan or the speeding away of the Enterprise after the Reliant activates the Genesis device. Mm. But it has a beauty unto itself that you have these two things that are happening and yep. this uh, race against, you know, the time is running out on the planet, on Camp Kittimer, before the Federation president gets assassinated. Time is running out for the Enterprise because the shields are down. And like you said, Steve, you know, they fired the torpedo, went right through the primary hull, like right tore right through it. Like while Spock and McCoy are working on the torpedo, you can hear Kirk over the uh, the PA system, where's that damn torpedo? <laughs> and McCoy says, all ready, Jim, lock and load. And then you have a moment, which is much, I know I've had a few critical things to say about this sequence. It's one of my favorite moments in any battle of all of Star Trek is the torpedo is ready and Kirk says, fire. Fire. Oh, yeah. Fire. Oh. Yeah. The way, the way they light him is beautiful. Well, and that the, the camera pushes in on him and he comes forward with the fist because he knows he has him. And it is, it's just an awesome Kirk moment. Yeah. Fire. And then when it fires and you see Chang stand up really fast and on his view screen, he sees the torpedo looking for him. And at that moment, a stern, proud, final moment that sums up the undiscovered country. To be or not to be. Target that explosion and fire. But this moment where you see the Enterprise and the Excelsior take turns firing their torpedoes onto the bird of prey and then it, it just explodes. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's very satisfying, but we are still not done because down on the planet at the conference, that assassin is now taking aim just as the crew of the Enterprise beams down. The assassin is about to fire, his hand is on the trigger, and Kirk leaps across the stage, tackling the president of the Federation, saving his life. I love that he says, Kirk, Enterprise. <laughs> just as he saves, as, as Kirk saves the Federation president, Scotty fires on the Klingon and he goes crashing through the window and, you know, lands and thuds on the, the floor, obviously dead. And it's not even a Klingon. It was the general, the Federation general played by Rene Aubergenois. Mm. He like, you know, the, the way that they show the Federation top, top officers uh, Admiral Cartwright, you know, and and now this guy, like that they wanted to keep the war going because the war is profitable and war gives old generals a sense of purpose and power. Your father called the future the undiscovered country. People can be very frightened of change. You've restored my father's faith. And you've restored my son's. Mm. I mean, it's such a personal moment between them, but it is a universal moment between the Federation and the Klingons moving forward. And everybody starts to clap. Even John Chuck, John Chuck's Klingon who hated Kirk mm. after, uh, you know, Star Trek four. It, 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 it's a really good moment. And we arrest the Romulan ambassador. We invest Admiral Cartwright, who was part of the conspiracy. Originally, when Valeris is being mind melded by Spock, she also listed Colonel West, the Rene Aubergenois character, and there was supposed to be more with him that they ended up cutting out of the movie. Mm. Um, I think it's so cool, Rosanna DeSoto's reaction, because she was there when Gorkin got killed. She was there when McCoy tried mm. to save him. She was there when McCoy in the trial said, my God, I... I was desperate to save him. And they cut to reaction shots to her. And I think she knew, you know what I mean? Like she, she, she really believed in her father's vision and really believes this moment. So I think it's a really nice moment. We're back on the ship. This scene was not only the last scene in the film, but it's the last thing, scene they shot in the film. Um, and I think that's really smart. 
you know, they they saved it till the end. This is the scene where we're going to say goodbye. We see the Excelsior and Enterprise, and there's a last conversation between Sulu and Kirk. And as the Excelsior is flying off, someone says, that's a big ship. And Scotty goes, not as big as our captain. Mm. Because, you know, Sulu was not on the Enterprise for all this. Yeah. But he had the better role because he wasn't sitting at the helm doing what he did for all those years. Mm -hmm. He was... He was on the he was in the captain seat of a of another starship, and he was a great captain. He saved the day, mm. and it was a great moment to send him off. And then the Enterprise is called back to the Starfleet to be decommissioned. And the wave of emotion that you can see going around the room, and in particular. William Shatner, you see Captain Kirk, you see a tear in his eye. I mean, he's so, this is such a sad moment. Oh, I guess that's it. It's all over. And mm -hmm. then Mr. Spock, the most logical, the most one, you know, more likely to play by the rules, not the rebel like Kirk is. He says, if I were human, I believe my response would be go to hell. <laughs> If I were human. And that lightens everything up. Everything he saves the emotional moment, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we ask for a heading. Kirk sits back into frame, into the chair. There's looks around the room. And Kirk thinks for a moment and then says, Second start of the right. And straight on till morning. Yeah, he owns the moment to obviously a quote from Peter Pan. Yeah. And they're all sitting at their stations, Kirk in the command chair, smiling. And we hear Captain Kirk give a final captain's log saying how this is the final voyage of the Starship Enterprise under my command. And the Enterprise is flying across the screen into the sun and so far into the sun where the light from the sun obscures what we see of the Enterprise. This ship and her history will shortly become the care of another crew. To them and their posterity will we commit our future. They will continue the voyage as we have begun and journey to all the undiscovered countries boldly going where no man, where no one has gone before. It is a, a perfect passing of the torch to not just the next generation, but every generation that followed D Space Nine, Voyager, the JJ movies, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> it was a perfect send off and so emotional to hear after all those years of hearing the beginning of Star Trek to boldly go where no man has gone before, you know, that he. That, that Shatner just said that opening monologue for the original series with so much energy and so much passion and so much enthusiasm with each passing verse of that monologue to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has like, it's like it gets you riled up. It gets mm -hmm. you like, like it's a rousing way to begin Star Trek every episode. And here he is, Correcting himself, wait a minute, it's not where no man has gone before. It's where no one has gone before. Mm -hmm. It's it's letting go of the past and looking to the future. It's a beautiful, it's, I was very moved by that moment, re-watching The Undiscovered Country for the Cinephiles. I think, it's, I think it's a perfect moment. I think it's such a good ending to, you know, yes, I have some criticisms of the film. I have no criticisms of this scene. I think it's great. I think I love the fact it's a very small choice that Nicholas Myers chose that it's only our main crew that is on the bridge of the Enterprise at the time. It's just the family. And then the next moment, I remember seeing it in the theater of the signatures coming up on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love. And John, you will love where Nicholas Meyer got the idea for this. Where? The musical 1776. Makes all the sense in the world. Of course. 
What's, of course. What's funny, yeah, what's funny about it is, is what he wanted was it to be signed James T. Kirk, Spock. Oh. He wanted the character signatures. It was Leonard Nimoy's idea to make it to actor signatures, wow. which I absolutely love. Right, because yeah, the, the, the rumor was they were not going to come back. This was it. This was the end. And then, of course, generations happened. But, you know, we'll deal with yeah, that. Yeah, and frankly, <laughs> I wish this was the end. <laughs> Although I do love Kirk's death scene in Generations. Um, well, I, I think that, that look, um, this this movie worked for, for so many reasons. As, yep. as a standalone movie, it's great. Mm -hmm. It is it is a, a darker movie than than we had seen for Star Trek, certainly. Uh, it is. It was concerning to see our beloved characters, particularly Kirk, in such a, a bad place. But thank God this movie happened at all, because I just remember after seeing Star Trek Four, I was on such a high, and then after seeing Star Trek Five, I was, I was on. I was so disappointed. Like my heart was broken mm. by Star Trek Five, and Star Trek Six was a rebound. It was the movie that this crew deserved to go out on. And I kind of wish that they did not, you know, that at least Shatner and uh, Jimmy Dewan and Walter Koenig did not do Generations. But I will say that the best parts of Generations were the parts with Shatner. The, the beginning on Enterprise B, mm -hmm. when Kirk saves the day, and I love that moment when he's on the bridge and he's about to sit in the captain's chair and he says to Captain Harriman, he goes, no, your place is on the bridge. I'll go. Like that's, you know, Shatner yeah. makes that work. Shatner makes that work. And he makes the scene at the end work with the horses. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm assuming the situation is grim and Picard says, yes. And he goes, sounds like fun. <laughs> and I don't know. When it comes to talking about Star Trek VI, I have to say, in Kirk's final words, it was fun. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, I don't know if those were your final thoughts, Scott, but I feel like we've sort of reached the end. Uh, this was the, the, big, the most successful opening weekend of any of the Star Trek films. It made $97 million. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing to note is that the movie came out on December 6, 91. The Soviet Union fell on December 25th, 1991. Wow, wow. Wow, wow. Just, wow. yep, mm, mm. 19 days later. Amazing, um, amazing. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it is so bizarre to me that this is Nicholas Meyer's last feature film. He has not just, directed a movie since. He's done some, t he's done TV, but he has not directed, I think he has not directed a feature film, at least not a major one mm -hmm. since then. This was just so, and I have no idea why. Um, uh, Scott, I don't know if those were your final thoughts. They were. But, okay. <laughs> John, do you have final thoughts on Star Trek six? Yeah. As someone who absolutely worships Star Trek, um, and, and you know, this, these films, and I'll say this straight up, these films decorated my life more than the Star Wars films did. They did. They just spoke to me in ways that the other, that Star Wars didn't. And it's not, you just have, you know, I know you comparing can be dangerous or whatever, but just, I know other people, they speak about how the Star Wars films influenced their lives and they were, you know, in love with the canon and the mythology and all of that. But it was Star Trek for me. It was Shatner for me. That's my dad. That's, I mean, that is my dad when I'm watching William Shatner. Nimoy, Spock is what I would aspire to be because I'm an emotional person. I can't be occasionally impulsive. I would love to be as relaxed and confident and calm and intelligent as Spock is. Scotty is great. Chekhov was great. Uhura as this black woman in the 60s representing all of that. That they check off the Russian on the ship. Just just the progressive nature of this show and the series itself with all the films that it led to this fantastic final film where the entire crew is together one final time is such a rare pleasure that you get in the world of films. Rarely do you get something that ends as perfectly as this did. And you can forgive Generations because the whole crew isn't on there. This is the one. If you stopped here, you don't need to go any further if you're a fan of the original 
series and the original actors. And they gave them a damn good story to work in with some great moments and some thought-provoking moments. And once again, some social, uh, progressive social values to consider and think about as you move forward. So overall, I think it's a beautiful way to end uh, all the, uh, original, the, the original series on a beautiful note that it strikes. And it's still a note of hope as it goes forward. It's still a note that hope is what keeps you young, keeps you thinking young. No matter how old you are, you can always hope for a better future, hope for a better ending, hope for a better galaxy overall. And as Scott just pointed out a few minutes ago, don't we all want that nowadays? Don't we all want to find that time where we're all back together again, hoping for a better future, united to make that happen, um, and aspiring to live out the utopian ideals uh, that the Federation and that Gene Roddenberry had in his mind when he created this series. So it's an incredible film for that and uh, so many fantastic performances from all the newcomers. Um, and I, it always makes me smile and it's my second favorite Star Trek film behind Wrath of Khan and, and, and probably won't be touched ever. So uh, here, here. I, love, <laughs> yeah, I love everything you said. It's so funny, the Star Wars Star Trek comparison because personally, I don't think there's a comparison. Well, and I don't mean right. that I, I don't right. mean that in the sense that one's way better than the other. I mean mm -hmm. that they're just completely different things. Mm -hmm. I adored the Star Wars movies. They thrilled me in ways that Star Trek stories never thrilled me. Mm -hmm. That they're just because the adventure, the action, the 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 spirit of those movies is just completely different. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I but for me it's the same is that Star Wars are movies I absolutely love. Star Trek's like my family that taught me lessons about life. Mm. There's you. just different things. And I was thinking as we've been talking, like, well, what's the lesson here? And as much as I have the same feelings that you do, Scott, about seeing our characters go to this place, the fact is, is that hearing Kirk, the person I love, say, let them die, I think about the fact, and then saying, all of us are human, mm. is that even people that we love can express things that we hate. And even people that we hate can have qualities that we can love. And that the idea of they are on the other side of the neutral zone and they are the bad guys is part of the problem. And there were Klingons who thought we were the bad guys and we thought they are the bad guys. And both sides, there were people to say, let them die. Mm -hmm. And that what Kirk has to do is the thing all of us have to do, which is question our premises. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to think about is like, well, what is it most important to question within your worldview? Is it the beliefs that you kind of believe in or the ones you hold most strongly? Mm -hmm. If you are absolutely certain that that person who believes that other thing is evil, well, then that is the point of view you need to question. Because as Kirk says, all of us are human. There is good over there. There is complexity over there. There are errors in myself and my own judgments. And there are things to constantly learn, even when you get old and inflexible. That is the time that it's even more important to question those inflexible beliefs. Mm -hmm. That is what Star Trek VI has taught me. And that is what Star Trek continues to challenge me to think. So. That's what we think of Star Trek VI. Of course, we always want to hear what you think. Please visit us on our Facebook page. Do a search for The Cinephiles. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cine underscore files, on Instagram at The Cinephiles Podcast. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Please leave your reviews there. Or maybe you subscribe to the show on YouTube and leave your comments there. Maybe you want to subscribe to the show on Spotify or through Overcast or through any of your other methods of getting it. You can get the show anywhere you want. You can buy or stream Star Trek 6 through Amazon Prime along with every other movie we've ever done. You can support the show on patreon.com slash the cinephiles. You could also hear a whole bunch more about James T. Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and the rest of the crew of the original series on our brand new podcast, Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. And just in two or three days, we will be releasing our third episode on the Corbomite Maneuver. John, how would they reach you? <laughs> you can reach me at the Roka says on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you'd like to come over to my YouTube page, see all the stuff we're doing there, please come over to youtube.com slash John Roka says the Outlaw Nation outlet. Come and be a part of that as well. And Scott Mance, you know there's no one else that we want to talk Star Trek with. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. 
where would people reach you on the interwebs if they needed to? Well, first of all, thank you for that applause, my friend, Johnny Roca. I love you. It is so great to be on The Cinephiles with you. And to everyone listening to this episode, please do go back and listen to every episode you possibly can of The Cinephiles. No one knows movies or talks about them better than John Roca and Steve Morris. This show is top tier movie chat conversation analysis. And this is a... a a show that you should absolutely subscribe to and bookmark and come back to week after week. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at movie Mance, and you can check out my YouTube channel, which is just Scott Mance, you know, look it up on uh, YouTube, search for Scott Mance for all my own film content. And, uh, and again, please uh, check out our brand new Star Trek series, our new podcast enterprise incidents. We're doing all 80 episodes of the original series and we're going in production order and we're having a blast. So you can catch us there. And John will be our first guest star Ooh. very, very, very soon. So that is it for this week. And we will see you next time with another great film on The Cinephiles. <laughs>